die, Father. There's nothing left. Ever since I was a child, I had a feeling that something is missing me. I want to know why I'm here. Can any of us know that? Become yourself. Then God and the devil don't matter. I want to learn. I want to understand. Be careful. Can you find the force to enable these two quite opposite lines to live together in your At any moment, the wolf can devour the lamb. And you must learn what it means to become responsible. This is an exact right. And that is why you are here. Welcome to everyone, our friends, new and regular listeners. We're delighted to be able to speak to you. Thank you for your interest in the deeper questions that we are trying to answer and also provide suggestions on where to look for further information. My name is Henrik. We are based out of Gothenburg, Sweden, going against the grain and counteracting the subjugation to the scientific dictatorship and the social engineering ongoing. We are doing our utmost to help break people out of the spell of complacency and the worship of authority and government that has struck not only my home country, but so many around the world. Red Ice Radio is available worldwide, where internet is available. RedIceCreations.com and RedIceMembers.com has more. Matt Presti and Robert Ote have teamed up to disseminate the cosmology of Dr. Walter and Leo Russell. Matt and Robert produced a video series explaining in great detail the collective works of Dr. Walter and Leo Russell, specifically the final distillation of the science and philosophy as written in the book Atomic Suicide. Walter Russell was an American polymath and a natural philosopher known for his unified theory in physics and cosmogony. Dr. Russell said that one of the best things to ever happen in his life was being taken out of school before he was ruined, which allowed him to conceive his knowing within the light of the universal mind, the uh, creator, directly. In the first hour, we discuss Rousselian science, which presents a new concept of the universe, one in unity with nature and the creator. Welcome, guys. Uh, Good to have you both with us. Uh, Hi, Matt. Thanks for coming on, uh, first of all, to you. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Henrik. Thanks for the invitation. You bet. And thanks to you as well, Robert. Uh, Great to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time talking with us. Thank you, Henrik. So, uh, we had had Matt previously on, uh, doing a primer on this topic a while back on uh, Radio 314 with uh, with Lana. A really interesting show, and I recommend everyone to kind of uh, uh, you know go back into the archives, check that out because it's it's really good stuff. But I, I, again, I think we should actually go back and backtrack a little bit, and uh, not assume that everyone has heard that show already. Uh, I kind of wanted to ask you guys, I guess, how you got introduced to the work of Walter and Leo Russell, uh, and also kind of why you wanted to pursue it. Maybe we can begin with you on that, Matt. Sure. Well, uh, I discovered the book, The Secret of Light, at a used bookstore, um, $2. Thought it was a uh, Freemasonic book. I was researching heavily into alchemy and shamanic experience, uh, the works of Terence McKenna, um, a little bit of Manly P. Hall, Sacred Geometry, the uh, Emerald Tablets of Toth, along those areas. And uh, uh, when I discovered that book, of course, it, it didn't seem to be something that was, it wasn't what I thought it was, put it that way. So it sat on the shelf for a few years, and uh, one day I, I picked it off the shelf, and I began reading it, and it was so profound and so incredibly uh, illuminating what I was reading that it was it was actually as if I was reading my own thoughts put to words that I was unable to express for so many years. So it had a sense of... Uh, of welcoming in, in, in the sense that it, it was very informative 
in explaining so many things that I had been unable to communicate, but yet somehow knew intuitively. So it was kind of a divine experience just reading that book. And uh, I remember exclaiming to my partner, Lori, um, after finishing it, that, you know, ignorantly, actually, that I never needed to read another book as long as I lived. It, it was that profound, and I had been researching for at least, you know, 10 or 12 years at that point. So, of course, I have read more books and, and primarily <laughs> have studied the works of Walter and Leo in-depthly as it, uh, it just seemed to strike a chord with my soul so profoundly that it's hard to uh, not uh, just get, get as much as you can um, from them for their words having such a, a positive effect in my world. Interesting. Now, uh, you guys teamed up, of course, somewhere along the road here as well. But tell, tell us about uh, how you got into this, Robert, as well, Walter's work. Uh, yeah, the, the seeds of Russellian science were really planted in my uh, belief system by a, a guy named Gene Davis from McMinnville, Oregon. I met him when I was mountain climbing out in the desert um, of eastern Oregon. There's a place called Steens Mountain. And uh, we were staying in a little place called Crystal Crane Hot Spring, and Gene was friends with the owner and he happened to be there and so he introduced me to the basic fundamentals of the cubic wave field and the, the science of Russellian science, you know, the foundations of it. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, that was in 1992. It took about another 10 years, you know, before I actually found out, you know, who had authored this material. And it turns out I found once, uh, you know, also uh, the secret of light is what I discovered as my first introduction to it. So immediately when I started reading The Secret of Light, I realized this is what Gene Davis was describing to me. So it you know, immediately resonated with all this, uh, this, um, this long germination period, I would say, like almost a decade where these thoughts were um, you know, developing and all of a sudden here it was in you know, full glory. You know, the Secret of Light is, is probably the best introduction anyone can have to the material because it's um, so accessible you know it's not too complex so really good now you guys have teamed up here along the way as well you've done some great work on on you know the secret of light series it's available on youtube uh really detailing you know the rusalian science and philosophy and such so uh how did this come about well i met robert uh online i was doing a search i the philosophy really clicked in my mind i was having a lot of trouble though with the uh with the science so I did a search for about six months just trying to find anything that that could be a companion to help explain the science in such a way that I could I could uh, more fully understand it. And uh, I kept coming across this website, uh, F-E-A-N-D-F-T, which is freeenergyandfreethinking.com, and um, just kept watching these different videos, and it really helped to uh, begin to unfold the flower of understanding, if you will. So I... Um, had started my own show called The Exploration of Consciousness, and for my uh, fifth guest, I had Robert Ote on. I contacted him and asked him to come on and kind of uh, give, a, give us his uh, ex- expose on his understanding of the science and the cosmology. And it uh, just began a working relationship at that point where we decided to carry the series on further uh, about a year later. Um, my 11th show, I was to have him back on and it ended up being a perpetual show that just seems to have no end in sight. So the tech series is actually an extension of the 11th show, which is still ongoing and, hmm. and might possibly be ongoing for some time. It, it may be the longest running podcast in history, but <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, it's, uh, it's, it's so fun. And it's been such a tremendous adventure and journey to uh, uh, learn about the foundational aspects of the science, which to me the hardest part is actually unlearning what I thought I knew about science and and trying to perceive it from a more advanced mind is, is a very difficult thing because the difficulty lies in its simplicity, not in its complexity. And I think for us as humans, we often, you know, we've come so far down the road of complexity that the simple things seem to be overlooked by many of us well, exactly. I mean, explaining the, the universe or, or having a, a theory of everything, as it were, is seemingly something very complex. But um, let's go about then trying to introduce this work of, of Walter and Leo Russell to, to our audience who might not have heard about it before. And anyone can uh, kick this off, of course, and, and we'll just head into that direction, guys. Sure. 
So anyways, uh, the difference between Russellian science and academic science is in academic science, they've removed the creator from creation. So that's foundational. And, and Russellian science is all about a creator-centered and bounded cosmology, which is proved through sacred geometry. Now, in Russellian science, we have two universes. We have the magnetic universe of stillness, zero curvature, and absolute cold which is the immutable, never-changing, you know, just the, the eternal uh, one condition that's always the same. Whereas the electric universe springs forth from that in temporal spiraling electric motions, which, um, which are completely controlled. They're centered and controlled uh, by the creator through uh, center points, uh, gravity shafts, and the six faces of the magnetic cube, which control every electrical motion that there is in the universe. So uh, the sacred geometry of the creator is provable and that's, um, that's what Frank Chester has been doing recently with his work in empirical studies of sacred geometry and uh, the unseen, as he calls it, the unseen space geometries, the super sensible geometries that actually give form to everything we see in the physical universe. Would, uh, Map, would you say that Russell is, say, I guess a mystic primarily? Uh, or, or did he come to all of this from, from a scientific background? He had no uh, scientific understanding at all when he had his illumination of 39 days in the year 1921 around his birthday. Uh, what he was given through divine illumination, which is acquiring knowledge through the light of mind, which would be acquiring knowledge through the still universe. As Robert said, we live in two universes, one of motion, one of stillness. And stillness is the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent um, universe of all-knowing mind which man accesses. And when he does access it, he, he describes it as a flash. And uh, people from Nikola Tesla to uh, Maurice Buick and his work with the book he wrote, Cosmic Consciousness, that detailed less than 40 people in human history have actually had a, a full-blown illumination. And... What Walter did was he wrote down 40,000 words and hundreds and perhaps maybe a thousand or so charts and drawings that became the foundation of the science. And through that illumination, he was instructed to deliver this to mankind in a first trial, which in 1926 he released, which was called the Universal One, which many people still to this day consider that his magnum opus. But... In the end, he amended it through the work of The Secret of Light, uh, A New Concept of the Universe, and finally, the book Atomic Suicide, which was co-written with, with Leo, his wife. And so he actually had to learn all the terminologies that, that science used in the day. And I think he even said of it that um, it was so strange and so utterly complex to him that it reminded him of the legends of the Arthurian sages who told of the world being held up by four elephants on each corner. <laughs> so he said, that, you know, he, he struggled for years to, to try to come to grips with the terminology and the, the understandings that they had. And, and he saw, like, flaws with Einstein's theory of relativity and also with other theories that were in direct conflict. So uh, his simple understanding, he had to learn the language of science in order to share his words in the Universal One but uh, as he discovered over time through the next 30 to 50 years that his own work needed amendments because the words that he used in his Universal One, uh, through his understanding, he had misused those words. So he amended those words to mean something different as the works and time went on. Hmm. There is a couple of these um, guys out there, this seems to. I, I wanted to ask you, because as you're talking a little bit more about Walter, it seems to remind me a little bit of a Danish mystic called uh, um, Martinus, or, or Martinus Thomasen, it was called. Have any of you heard of, heard of him? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you it's have? It's very similar. It is very yeah, similar, absolutely. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the Third sure. Testament, That's and with the, you know, even the, the, the reference to the drawings, if you will, as well. I, I just wonder if there's more people who are, well, uh, for the lack of a better word, given this insight. What, what do you think, Robert? Well, absolutely. We all have access to this through the stillness of our hearts, you know, because our, our thinking is electric. It's based on the electrical processes of the brain and the senses. But the knowing is magnetic. It comes from stillness. And the creator's uh, magnetic universe is where we have access to all information, all knowledge. 
so basically what's happening is we're tapping into our own self-knowledge. This is really a matter of remembering what we already know. You know, I mean, we've been, we've been mind-controlled, let's put it that way, socially engineered in this, in this lifetime, all of us. We've all been through the, through the racket. We've been through academicism and, and brainwashed by, you know, the idiot box and what have you. But yep. uh, the truth is, is we have that, the ability to go straight into the, the sense of knowing, which is in stillness. It doesn't come through thinking. It comes through, through stillness. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I remember Martinez, he was, uh, his experience was that he was like, he had an intention basically focusing uh, upon God, a kind of a meditation, I guess, if you will. And uh, sorry if I missed this, but let's clarify that again. Was was Walter, was this something he was asking for? Did he want to have this uh, vision, if, if you will, uh, Matt or Robert? I can take that. Um He was actually, he, he talked of it as being prepared for it. Uh, he said as early as he could remember, he could play any song he heard on piano with one finger at eight months old. And uh, his first actual full-on illumination was at seven years of age. And he details that in the second unit of the home study course, version three. Uh, I can't speak for the other versions out there, but... Uh, for the one I, I have and recommend, Robert and I both recommend version three because it was the last amended uh, home study course that was uh, amended by Walter and Leo themselves. Um, he describes it fully, the experience, and uh, seven years of age was his first one. He had one every year around his birthday, and his mother would say that that you know for five or six days he would go off in the woods a lot to be alone and she would say that he was having one of his queer spells <laughs> <laughs> so um, in that time every seven years he had a major illumination and in those major illuminations he was given much more during those times so in a sense um, you know, he was prepared for this if you will is there any part of this which is has to do with any kind of uh, I don't know, selection, I guess one, one question that arises is why why him, uh, Matt? That's an interesting question. I mean, uh, certainly in his, in his major illumination at, at uh, 49 years of age, he said he was shown 10,000 times 10,000 of his lifetimes. And it was even rumored in circles of people that worked at the university that he had mentioned to Leo that, that he really felt strongly that he was Leonardo da Vinci in a past life, and also Mozart. And if it is true that that uh, if you are shown your past lives and you can see, you know, that kind of um, memory within your own Akashic record of yourself, then it's quite possible that that you know that preparation for all those years begins to unfold into a super sensible reality where. You know, you, you truly understand your purpose, and that's one of the things they taught primarily was living purposefully, and that this was a purposeful universe. But yeah, that's a good question, Henrik. Well, I don't think we'll ever know for sure. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd like to add to that also that uh, you know it wasn't a very unique experience. Obviously, there's been so few people that have had that kind of experience, but many of us have had minor illuminations, many illuminations. Uh, either under the use of entheogens, which uh, Matt and I have both experienced many times, or the other uh, way that I find I get a lot of my, my information is, uh, as, as Matt said, going out in nature, being in nature, walking, and uh, letting your mind go, stopping the thinking, uh, the chatter of all the, the garbage, you know, we're surrounded by all the, the propaganda, the media stuff, uh, all the, the cares and worries of the world. And that's when the information uh, from within, from that stillness, st starts to flow outwards. And so, I think that all of us experience this on a on a minor scale a lot. You know, many of us that are seeking truth, but uh, you know, there, his his experience was extremely rare. So that that might mean, Robert, if if we go back far in human history, um, there might have been uh, well thousands of people that actually had access to this information and had this knowledge. Uh, within them, if you will, I've always tried to realize and understand why this kind of well, why why the fall seemed to have taken place. There seems to have been a a natural, instinctual knowledge in the past that mankind have have lost, if you will. Absolutely, there was obviously a high tech civilization that was wiped out about thirteen thousand years ago. I mean, it's found all around the planet. So, yeah, there's definitely been a much higher level of civilization that's existed on this planet. So. We're just kind of, you know, this is kind of like Planet of the Apes, only it's, you know, the apes this time are humans, you know.
<laughs> the the circle is is complete. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Matt, what what do you, what do we know about the relationship between Walter and and, and Leo? And when when she, I guess, well, this was late in his life, as as you said before. Uh, but when she came into the picture, and if she was you know supportive of, of that, or if there was any problems, I guess along the way. Absolutely. Well, to, to understand that, we'd have to go back to the beginnings of Leo's life. And uh, from all the research I could come up with, and there's a wonderful book on her personal life called Remembered for Love, written by J.B. Yount III. And he details uh, her life progression and her story. And uh, she was extremely advanced as a small child, uh, having had illuminations of her own, uh, extremely artistic, um, able to draw and, and paint and and things like that. She uh, became a successful cosmetics and uh, um, different uh, um, creations in that sense that uh, she worked with her first husband to uh, put that stuff out there. And after that didn't work out, at some point in time, she uh, traveled the world for a while, went to Egypt, and apparently had some extremely rare experiences there in sense in the terms of knowing and and uh, just increasing her knowledge and uh, her truth seeking uh, she finally came to America around 1946 I believe and uh, attended a lecture at the request of one of her her good friends in America and that lecture was one of Walter's speeches and one of his lectures so uh, when she heard him speak, she knew instantly that he knew some of the deeper things that she had given thought to all her life. But uh, he had mentioned of her that uh, had he not met her, and this was actually from a recording, I think it was a Cosmic Life from the Mind, uh, one of his reco few recorded lectures, that had he not met her, met her, he would have continued to talk over everybody's head. <laughs> because to him, it was he, he thought this knowledge of the universe was obvious to everybody. And I guess that's a mistake a lot of geniuses make, and, and also part of the reason why genius is crucified and has been for 2,000, maybe more years. Because people that are extremely advanced in their thinking, uh, they think that's how everybody else thinks. <laughs> but when, Big mistake. Yeah. Lo and behold, <laughs> they find out after either, you know, <laughs> You know, hanging from a tree or somewhere else, you know, that, that that was not correct. But fortunately, Russell didn't get crucified in the sense physically, but but mentally and emotionally, uh, science utterly rejected his work. And uh, Leo, part of her reasoning and her the beauty of her balance in coming into this was she convinced him that he should get his work out of the uh, Smithsonian and 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 try to re-deliver it and she would also assist him in this effort and uh, he was still married at the time they didn't actually uh, get married until after his divorce some years later but she had worked with him full on to help deliver the message of the divine Iliad which is his 40,000 word magnum opus that he wrote with with nary a correction in 1921 and that's what she talked him into releasing and and through her guidance and support uh, that's why the message is here and it's it's so inspiring it's perhaps in, in my opinion and, and I know I've read quite a lot of books maybe not all but one of the most inspiring works of, of literature I've ever read hmm. are there any I guess archives today any keepers of this knowledge I mean you guys are carrying it on of course and, and bringing attention and focus to it but is there more beyond that I'm not familiar with that Sure. Well, the, the University of Science and Philosophy was established in 1949. Uh, it was formerly the Walter Russell Foundation, which Leo established to guarantee that the world would be able to review and receive his work. Uh, that university is still in existence today. It's not uh, locatable due to it. it's being disbanded in 1998, but it does still sell the books and carry the message. Uh, the website for that is philosophy.org, and Michael Hudak's currently the president of that. And uh, uh, there are others who are just uh, you know, trying to carry on the message. Many former students that we've met along the way, um, lots of student study groups here and there. Um, it's not as uh, widespread as, as as it used to be, but then again, messages like this aren't easy to uh, come across, and when they do, they're so profound that. That, uh, it takes a while to absorb. So, uh, like I said, I think the majority of my trouble with it was just it's so simple that, that it's, it's hard to see the universe in such a sim simplistic way. 
But after uh, much meditation and, and much decent trading from concentrating, it seems to just have a such a significant tune of truth that rings intuitively within it. Indeed, uh, Robert, uh, let's talk a little bit about the well, what the what the universe is. So now we explain it from the uh, Russellian, you know, science and philosophy perspective, and I want to uh, get into a little bit as well of how it differs from from what we are taught and all the you know anguish that we're you know. Uh, drag through as younglings trying to understand the world that we live in. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, we're taught, you know, there's a nuclear atom, you know, and that's obviously wrong. You know, I mean, even my professors told me that in 1976 in my first chem class that it was not real and yet it's still being taught, you know. So, uh, you know, they have quantum theory and string theory and all these things which have no relationship to reality. They're just uh, based on mythematics and misinterpretations and uh, the shell games of physics, you know, they're not based on reality at all. So the, the real difference between this is it's not based on empirical reductionism and materialism. It's based on knowing, and knowing comes from stillness. It comes from the creator itself. That's what the illumination is all about. So this science is basically, um, it's based on the, the reality of, of nature. It's not based on groping in the dark theories. It's not. Um, uh, it's it's confirmed through you know sacred geometry. It's confirmed through spiraling phi, uh, the the divine signature of the architect, the divine architect. It's seen throughout the universe. So the confirmation of this work is seen in nature. It's not something that's like a Gedanken experiments performed by Einstein sitting in his armchair smoking his pipe. It's not based on mathematics, it's based on sacred geometry, which is provable. And as I said earlier, Frank Chester is proving that. He's proving these unseen space geometries, which are lawful, as Frank says. They either the angles and the lines and in, in, in the, the geometries meet up and match, or they don't. You can't fake it, you know. With math, you can. Math is a language. Uh, like any language, it can be used to deceive somebody. Uh, what we're practicing now in academia is mathematics, uh, the math of myths, things like dark uh, matter, dark energy, black holes, big bangs, all these uh, these things that actually don't exist at all, yet uh, they're receiving billions of dollars in taxpayer funding to send satellites into space to confirm this garbage, and even this, it's even being falsified in real time. I mean... Um, Science is actually being falsified with things like the, the Hadron Collider. They're claiming they found the God particle. And so they're the desperate attempts of modern science to, to shore up this entire fake science that they're teaching, it's, it's laughable. I mean, it's comical. Whereas, you know, somebody like Frank Chester doesn't need billions of dollars. He's sitting in a little tiny apartment out in the Presidio, and he's performing all this stuff on a few small tables in his living room. You know, and what he's finding is far more profound than the Hadron Collider or the Kobe satellite or a tokamak fusion reactor. All these things are massive, uh, you know, gluttonous, taxpayer sucking waste because what it does is it enslaves us to the people that are running this racket who are the energy barons, the warmongers, and the central bankers that profit from this pyramidal system of control. So this is, this is a massive difference, you know. We have a science which is easily accessible to anyone in their own homes, and you don't have to go out and spend a billion or a trillion dollars in all this, uh, this stuff that, that creates this monolithic science, you know, that uh, is run by the powers that be. Well, it seems to be a political game, and, and this idea that we have to be disconnected from it, that, you know, this very, uh, you know, thing that you said, Robert, that we cannot be... We cannot discover what it is by ourselves. We have to have, as you said, you know, billions of, of dollars at disposal, and, and we have to have, uh, you know, so-called educated people there. And uh, Matt, you wanted to jump in there as well. Sure, I'd just like to to add to that. Um, again, the fundamental difference, in in a sense, you could say, is that our current mainstream science is using motion to define the motion universe, where what Russell saw was the prime condition of the universe, which is stillness. And as we know, we can do this with any experiment of our own. Uh, if your computer's off, you could call it still. When you turn it on, the electricity is given to it, and it begins to move. Uh, you, can, you can strum a guitar string. It, it starts in a condition of stillness and returns to it. 
um, birth. Uh, human embryo is, is the, the beginning of, of a human being, starts at stillness and returns to it eventually. So any condition in the universe is like this. You could, you could say it about a grandfather clock. It's still until you wind it, and then it'll unwind over a period of a week or more. So the, the prime condition of the universe, as Russell saw it, is one of stillness. And if I may just put a quote out there um, from Russell... Sure. It, it, meaning science, is at long last realizing that the action universe of motion must have a fulcrum which does not move. This will lead to the placing of energy in the fulcrum source of this universal mirage of motion instead of in the mirage extension where science now places it. When that day comes, science will first question the universal vacuum for cause rather than search with an effect for cause. When this transformation takes place in man's thinking, science will have leaped ahead 1,000 years in that day. And what I really think that means is that, uh, you know, it, it, it's an obvious mistake, I think, that, that most scientists' stillness is right in front of their face, right in front of their noses. But that's the last place they seem to look. And that the stillness, they don't think that energy can be con contained in, in anything that's still. So Russell saw through the veils of motion, through the veils by the divine illumination of knowing mind, and he brought this knowledge to mankind, and uh, we can deny the stillness all we want, but it is the prime condition of the universe, and I think when we finally wake up and become aware of that fact, we can begin to understand motion for what it really is and what it means for motion to be the illusion, as so many mystics throughout time have said of motion being an illusion. So it's just a different way of looking at it, and it's very simple. We're in we're in a movement, uh, and we're trying to measure another movement of sorts. It's 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 the um, uh, what do you call it the, the the oxymoron of being in a laboratory and trying to measure something, uh, you know, outside of of being outside of it. We're 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 part of it, and we can't put ourselves outside of it and trying to understand what it is. It's just not uh, going to happen with 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 the way that we have you know the tools at our disposal today, but. That's right. Um, and if you, if real yeah. quick, if, yeah. you would, if, if you look at this, the reason they keep getting all these different particles and they get smaller and smaller and smaller is because they're working their way towards stillness. They're just taking the long road to get there. So hmm. they keep finding smaller yeah. and smaller. So, Robert? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, Planck's length is the limit. You know, according to you know, Hawking and his ilk, you know, they believe that there's a limit to the size something can be, and it's no smaller than the Planck's length. So they've got on one side of their little box, they've got a limit placed, and the other side of their big bang, one way, heat, death, entropy, uh, you know, disappearing universe is the edge of the bubble, you know, that's supposedly 13.8 billion years old. Which is, of course, absurd. You know, uh, the, the the huge difference here is, as Matt was saying, it's motion. You know, it's uh, this is a universe of motion. All motion is an aberration in stillness, and all motion within the uh, electric universe is done by repetition. And so that's why fractal math, for instance, is so accurate at describing nature because it's based on the same thing. It's this feedback. It's this iteration feedbacks that you know electricity is pulsed to a wave field boundary, it's recorded in the Akashic substance, which is the inert gases, voided in stillness, radared back to its source while being transferred into the neighboring wave fields of, st of space. So the, the motions are fractal motions because there's these, it's like uh, the pendulum swinging. At both sides of the pendulum, when it reaches its top point, there's that moment of rest before it starts back in the other direction. The same is true of your breath or of your heartbeat. And so there's these, there's these stillnesses, you know, that are these gaps, or even in a, in a cinema, you see gaps between still images of film that are run on a reel that give the illusion of motion, but they're, they're broken up by these still spaces. And that's the way nature actually works. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. So does Walter try to attempt to, I mean, answer some of the most profound questions? Again, I, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the work yet and don't know how everything's laid out and all that, but... Basically, if people are seeking answers to, you know, what, how was everything created? Was it created by a god? Is it, is it nature? What are we? Why are we here? Etc. Are these questions we, we get answers to in Walter's work? Yeah, it's being created perpetually. 
it wasn't created in the distant past. And then a guy in a uh, you know a long white beard and a throne and a <laughs> robe uh, just sat back on the side and watched it. It's being created constantly right now. I mean, it's uh, this is a, a a universe of illusion. Light is spinning so fast in these pulsing. Rep- repetitive fractal kind of conditions that it appears to the limitations of the human sis- uh, senses that this light is solid. It's a piece of wood or a piece of iron or a tree. But th- that's because it's pulsing at trillions of times per second. We can't even tell the difference between 27 frames per sec- uh, second in a motion picture that gives the illusion of motion. So how could we possibly tell the illusion of motion when it relates to atoms? It's impossible. Hmm. But that's what, in fact, what's, what, what the reality is. As the Hindus said, this is all Maya. This is all illusion. There's nothing but light in the entire universe. So who put it here? Or where does it come from? Walter, his first book, he entitled it The, uh, the Universal One. And what he found was that the, the fundamental difference between science was that the materialist believes mind to be an effect of matter where the mystic interpretation of the universe is that mind is causal, that mind is what creates matter. So to Russell, mind is God, and that means the mind of a plant, the mind of a star, the mind of, a, of an animal or an atom, that mind is the cause of these motions. And this, this humanity that we are in, uh, in striving to find those answers, you know, Two, 3,000 years ago in Greek philosophy, we had 12 gods, uh, each representing a different emotion of man. So you can see where it got less and less. We, we, we went from having so many gods to having a monotheistic view. And now that monotheistic view is, is in question uh, because we're, we're traded the monotheism for 12 different kinds of particles that might cause all this stuff. So Russell <laughs> knew that mind being indivisible and that each person, each human, each element, each, um, each uh, piece of matter in and of itself has a mind source upon which the element or the person or the star spins around or revolves around. And he saw this condition of mind as omnipresent. And in our 16th unit, we, sh- we called it the uh, creator's still magnetic light. We took pictures of galaxies and inverted them to try to pass along what it is to ki- try to kind of conceive what universal mind might be. And you could see the, the black of the galaxy on the white background. And in that, you can almost understand how mind is omnipresent from this point of view. And uh, mind being causal, as Russell said, um, and what he saw and how he explained it really does give you an interpretation of the creator in a way that no one else ever has. And it removes the emotional definitions of what God is, not the angry God, anthropomorphic male God on the side of the mountain setting bushes on fire. This is actually universal mind does not judge. It just creates life. That's all it does. And it does so in perfect balance. And uh, anything we violate in that balance, we reap the the result of, of that breakage of the law of balance by our equal breaking from nature's uh, perfect hand. So everything that we do to ourselves, if, to the degree that we break that law of balance in the universe, is to the degree we're broken by it. And it's just a beautiful, seamless cosmology. It, it is a two-way motion universe, a motion of centropy, as Buckminster Fuller said, to borrow his term, which is the upward flow of electricity, and then the downward flow, which is entropy. But currently, our science only recognizes entropy as the yeah. reality. Yeah. There is no uphill flow of electricity, and that's a grave mistake. It's a mistake because to not at least consider it, you know, to say that, you know, Nobody who's, who's had a divine illumination should be listened to or believed or even studied. Uh, we've tried to contact several people in earnest to just get them to look at things. And, and the, the, this typical standard reply from the academician is don't waste your time on Russell. Mm. Just, just check out Leonard Susskind or somebody like that and he'll explain it all for you. But the problem with that is, is you know, a lot of us don't understand all this stuff. And, and like Robert said, it's mathematics. It's, you have to go through years and years and years and, um, I guess uh, just to put it more simply, Russell saw through the veil and he, he, uh, he described God in a way, and, and I know that term is loaded. We said that on, on the interview with Lana that uh, he, he preferred to think of it as the universal one, which is why he entitled his first book to be named so. 
Yeah, and I might add to that real quickly, though, that the creator is sexless and formless. You know, the, um, the, uh, these ideas of the anthropomorphic male or female gods, you know, those are uh, part of the, the sex division of nature. They're the, a part of the electric universe. They're not of the magnetic universe of stillness. That's the huge difference. So if you're worshiping a male or a female god, you're worshiping the creation and not the creator. Yeah. And uh, today, science is the new religion. It's taking over, and it's uh, monolithic in its own way, and uh, it's very unfortunate. We we recently had uh, uh, Rupert Sheldrake with us. We we talked about the science delusion, and he uh, he also kind of breaks <laughs> down, you know, some of these misconceptions. Yeah, really good stuff. And and uh, yeah. I mean, I want to get into this as well. As you, you mentioned some of them earlier, I think Robert quantum mechanics, you know, dark matter, big bangs, black holes, all that kind of stuff. But uh, let maybe we can just outline some of the big misconceptions with science or, or, or like the areas that they're looking into to explain things uh, and, and how you would, I guess, explain away them. We can begin with you, Robert. Okay. Well, yeah, for instance, uh, the atomic theory, the nuclear theory of the atom, uh, you know, nature doesn't work like that. They have the nuclear theory of the atom, these little balls, you know, that are protons and neutrons and somehow they're magically all huddled together in a nucleus and then there's these whirring little, uh, you know, pinballs that are flying around in all different directions. Nature doesn't work like that. Nature has um, equatorial planes of division which divide sex waveforms, whether they're male or female. You know, red would be the male spectrum, blue would be the female spectrum. Those div divided, sex divided electrical waveforms are seeking mates which are spinning in the same directions. And so the opposite mate is is that you know spinning in the same direction. If you look at the Earth, for instance, you know you'll see that uh, the North Pole. If you look down from the top, you'll see it's spinning clockwise. If you look up from the the bottom, you see it, it appears to be going cl uh, counterclockwise. But in reality, there's only one direction. They're both spinning in the same direction, and that's what gives the rotation to the Earth. Now, quantum mechanics, for instance, is based on the fallacious idea that energy is in matter, that it comes in these little bundles called uh, fundamental quantums of energy. And uh, that's not the way that works either in nature. Nature is based on the fulcrum of stillness. All energy, it comes from the fulcrum. It's extended in the two levers of the twin opposing vortices, the male and the female, that are divided at cathode planes of stillness. That's where all energy comes. All energy comes is a, a, a desire to be from the creator. There's sex-divided tensions, and this is a bipolar sex-divided universe, the electric universe, that is. The magnetic universe has absolute control. It both centers it from fulcrum points of stillness and houses all of those uh, spiraling electric waves within the, the zero curvature planes of cold stillness of the magnetic cubes. So... We have a science that actually explains how nature works, you know, as opposed to, you know, the craziness. I mean, uh, you, you know, academia has gone out with strings, which has turned in now to membranes and brains, as they call them, mm -hmm. and all this. And there's 10 to 500 versions of this garbage. And the top chairs in academia in the United States, for instance, are all string theorists. Yet there's no truth or reality to string theory at all. It's complete, utter garbage. It seems to be all about division as well, uh, and and with what tool you can divide with whatever the latest, smallest part that you've been able to find, and then you divide that and divide. Does I mean, does that matter even in in terms of like sizes and everything that we're trying to look into these atoms and and the smallest part to be able to understand what it is? Do do will we ever find something there? Absolutely, that's the problem. It's uh, empirical reductionism, con constantly trying to break things into smaller and smaller units. And as um, is uh, Walter Russell said, you might as well cast nets into the ocean in search of oxygen. You know, mm. it's, a, it's a futile effort. And what it does is it ensures the energy barons, warmongers, and central bankers maintain their status by sending humanity down a dead end road, you know, with hadron colliders and tokamak fusion reactors, all this garbage that enslaves humanity. I've been thinking about so maybe that's that, a slush fund. Sorry to interrupt, Robert, but. I mean, the, the, the Large Hadron Collider, is the, it's the biggest science experiment in human history. And I don't know how many billions of euros it costs, but it's a lot. And what have they gotten out of it? I mean, the a baguette shut the thing down a while back, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, that, that would have right. saved Cyprus if they oh, wouldn't well, have exactly. built that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, I, I question if it even works. That's <laughs> yeah, indeed. Right. 
who would know? You yeah. know, yeah. just like going to the moon. You know, I mean, it's obviously you know garbage. You know, so uh, let's talk about the well things from the the you know the uh, quantum mechanics kind of point of view a little bit here. Uh, and, and see how that kind of matches up, if you will. We have things like the observer's effect, for, for example. If uh, creation is an unfolding process, uh, then it's a pretty interesting concept. If we are there with our mind, as you talked about earlier, Matt, we, we maybe we're there to to influence influence it, if you will, uh, along the way. I mean, is there any idea here that coincides that we are creators? That reality, reality is, uh, you know, uh, subjective pretty much, and we can influence it. Well, from my own in- interpretations of what creation is, I mean, it, it's it's certainly you can influence if you work knowingly with it. I mean, you can influence uh, not now matter outside of yourself. You can certainly control a guitar or a keyboard or an instrument or a machine, but can you fundamentally change its makeup? That's that's uh, something you know. I, I just don't necessarily know that you can or can't, but. Uh, that question's maybe a little out of my league, maybe one better that Robert might be able to expound on. But uh, well, think, I think I, um, I I would well I would say you know at the heart of all this lies this uh, the shell game that, uh, with the dual slit experiment. This has been the foundation of a lot of the quackery associated with quantum mechanics, and it's a lie because what they're saying is is that they're firing electron balls you know from the nuclear theory of the atom through slits, and that's that's a full-blown lie because those balls don't exist. The nuclear atom does not exist. An electron gun fires electrical discharging waveforms, which are spiral. So they're not shooting little marbles, you know, like in the uh, the secret, I mean, what the bleep do we know with a little cartoon showing the guy firing the balls and all that. That's, that's just BS. There's no truth to it all. And what happens uh, if anybody has ever studied photography and built a, a pinhole camera, what happens to waveforms when they come through an aperture like a tiny hole? They expand. So basically the foundations of their their little game that they're playing with the dual slit experiment is a fraud it's a shell game they're swapping non-existent theoretical electrons from the nuke the theoretical nuclear atom for actual electric waveforms that we produce in electron guns electron microscopes and th- things of this nature so the two aren't even related interesting well there's a lot yeah. more to add to this of course we're gonna we're gonna carry on in a little while and talk more in the second segment we're gonna uh, get into it and, and, and continue in the Rosalian uh, universe, if you will, and, and try to uh, kind of just lay this out for people and explain it a little bit more. It's very interesting, and uh, I want to, of course, end this segment with both of you giving us some more details of where people can find your work, what you guys have uh, available on your websites and everything else, and you have, of, of course, done some joint works that we want to talk about as well, and if there's anything else. But why don't we uh, begin with you, Matt? Want to give out your websites and everything and see um, you know, where we can send people for more info. Sure, Henrik. Uh, my personal website is Matt Presti, M-A-T-T-P-R-E-S-T-I dot com. Uh, I have music and interviews from the exploration of consciousness there. Uh, our joint website is thesecretoflight.com, which was recently updated and is a work in progress perpetually. And then I'll turn it to Robert. Yeah, my website is Free Energy and Free Thinking. It's uh, abbreviated F E a n d f t dot com and my youtube site where uh also we've had all our our work mirrored as well as many other i have three uh, uh Russellian science playlists with a lot of other people's work as well that is 77 g slinger is in guitar slinger and uh you can see uh i have 666 videos as of today with the last seven i just uploaded from frank chester so there's a lot of information backing this yeah, I want to talk more about Frank Chester. I haven't heard about him before. It sounds really interesting. So we'll get into it in the second. So stay with us, guys. Really appreciate this. It's going to be a lot of fun carrying on. Hey, by the way, uh, is there anything you guys are up to in terms of uh, events or, or are you doing any talks or anything like that? Yes, Henrik. Actually, we're doing a conference um, September 7th and 8th at Swannanoa, the former home of Walter and Leo Russell and the University of Science and Philosophy. Um, that's put on jointly by the center of the One Heart Homecoming and the Russellian Science and Philosophy Conference. Uh, the center of the One Heart's a group of former Russell students um, and others who 
have agreed to make their theme since they rent the palace once a year for their homecoming event. They wanted to bring in the uh, Brasselian group of folks, uh, Robert, myself, David Gibbons, Alan Lee Adkins, uh, Michael Hudak, possibly Dr. Tim Binder, who was former president of the USP, and uh, multiple others, uh, Jeffrey and Diane Bullington, Jim and Jackie Porter, uh, to make an event to uh, basically center around the science and philosophy of Walter Russell and Leo Russell. The title of the event is the uh, first annual Russellian Science Philosophy Conference in conjunction with the Center of the One Heart. The name of the conference is The Power of Love and Action, The Cosmology of Walter and Leo Russell. And I hope... Uh, Whoever is around the area, uh, we have people coming from all over Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania. There's people from Hawaii, the UK. Uh, we have people from possibly Nigeria, South Africa, as well as Australia, all coming to attend this event. Uh, so we'd love to see some more folks find interest and hopefully be able to participate. And give us the website and, and the dates for this again, Matt. Okay, yes, that can all be found at thesecretoflight.com. Uh, the conference page is, is being built now, so that should be up in the next week or so. But uh, hope to uh, attract a lot of newcomers and also a lot of former students to get everybody together to be able to speak freely about their memories and their, their uh, interpretations as well as uh, the hopes for the future of what this science and philosophy can, can help to achieve for the benefit of all mankind. Very good. The secret of light.com. And we'll have uh, all the links that our uh, guest here mentioned under our relevant links on redeyescreations.com. So go there in case you missed any of these URLs and uh, click through easily and uh, check it out because it's good stuff. We'll be right back. If I find a river that would lead me home to you, you know I'd cross that river a thousand times for you. I wanted her with all my might and I lost my way that lonely night I rode a crooked trail, missed the river by miles If I find that river, I'm gonna follow it On a spotted horse We stride is true But all I do Is ride a trail Of a dusty ground And brush and shale I wanted her With all my might And I lost my way That lonely night I rode a cookie trail Just a river by my
In the second hour, we delve into more detail on the principles of creation and the nature of our universe. Robert critiques the academic sciences, including quantum physics and the new age ideas which have sprung out of it. We'll also hear more about Frank Chester's empirical research providing the validity of Russellian science. Later, we discuss Walter Russell's blueprint for a free energy device and his proposal ending up in the hands of NORAD in the 1960s. The hour ends on a discussion about psychopaths who uphold explodemia science. Sign up for a subscription at redeyesmembers.com to continue to listen to this or any of our previous programs. We have uh, close to 700 programs on all kinds of different topics. We have, of course, more upcoming as well. Next is Ian Crane. Then we have Kevin Barrett, Graham Hancock, Chris Thomas, and Dean Clifford, to name a few. You're welcome to tune in again when we're back with more soon, but we'll proceed right now after a short break with Matt and Robert. See you on the other side.